This is a continuation of a talk that I gave back in January, talking about uh, locality-sensitive hashing. And we've got some more, uh, more information and results to, sh to, to share, which is why we thought it was worthwhile to come back and, and give you a progress report. And this will probably not be the last progress report you see on this. So what is locality sensitive hashing and why do we care and what's it all about anyway? So it's about large scale searches. Uh, large scale, we might have a candidate image and we wanna find a similar image on the internet uh, that looks like this, this dude. Um, and that's the, the kind of problem we're trying to solve. Um, at, at the end, I will ask you who this person is, but we'll wait on that one. Um, we might also have a very similar uh, problem, which is we have a source repo and we wanna find all of the other source repos in GitHub that it, the, the code in there might have been um, borrowed from. Um, we might have documents and, and you know, I, from time to time I teach and there's always an issue with, you know, this, this paper is just a little bit too perfect. Um, and, and so basically it comes down to the problem of your, there's a large scale X search. We've got one candidate and we wanna find others like it that might be out there. So the key word here is large scale. So it's the, the, the kinds of problems we're trying to solve are ones that don't fit on a laptop, they're, they're just, the, the, they're, they're the kinds of problems that you have to go out and, and actually do a lot of search on. Um, and that's what gets it, that's what makes this problem interesting and in some sense different. Um, so here's an example that I wanted to start out with. Uh, the application that somebody developed you know, people like you. Uh, it characterizes, it goes through Facebook, it figures out who the people are that might be kind of like you, whether you know them or not. And, uh, and it basically crawls through all of Facebook to figure that out, right? Um, just a note, this is a pedagogical example, I have not been associated with the company that, that did this work. I don't even know if they are still in business. Um, but it's, it's a fun example to think about uh, because you're, you're talking about large scale, you're talking about you know, crawling through a database of a billion people. So when I say find people like someone else, what do we mean? That's just a definitional thing. Uh, well, we, we say somebody is like someone else. You know, you might be 100% like somebody else or you might be 10% like someone else. And really what we mean is that we like, we like the same things as you do. Um, and it's a very set theoretic notion of you know, of, of all the things that I like and all the things that you like, um, you know, what's the intersection of those sets and what's the union and, and that ratio is what determines whether we are, whether our likes are similar or dissimilar. It's a very intuitively obvious definition, actually. Um, and the real challenge here is the n square problem. You've got a billion users, and yeah, some of them have their profiles locked up so you can't see them, but the rest of us 
uh, are still searchable, and there's probably billion minus 10 that are, um, that are searchable this way, right? So it's still a big problem. So what we want to do is we want to see, we want to walk through all of the people. Uh, we want to walk through all of their likes. And, uh, and if we could do that, and if we could cluster all of those people, I mean, the, 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 the problem we're trying to go after is the n-square problem. Because you know there's some hope that we can go through a billion people, but there's no way we're going to go through a billion squares. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out if there's a way we can hash everyone into a set, into a bucket. And then when a new user logs in or we find out about a new user, we want to see if, um, if we can find people like that user by looking in just one of those buckets. And, and that's the key. The, the key is, can we find a, can, can, we, can we hash everyone into a bucket so it minimizes our, our search space? If we could do that, we, we'd achieve our, our goal, for sure, right? And that is the magic. That is the magic of this set of algorithms that we refer to as locality-sensitive hashing. Um, so the, the idea, very simply, is let's say I have an n-valued vector. Uh, let's say I draw random hyperplanes through that space. And for each hyperplane, I figure out whether a particular point is above that hyperplane or below that hyperplane. And if I can do that, I can come up with a hash. You know, you see two items on this chart. You see three hyperplanes, and we know how each one of them hashes. This is the simple idea. And now we just multiply it a gazillion times, and and it continues to work, we think, we hope. And at this point, really what we've done is we've got the same idea. Of, and the key now is, can we find these hash functions, these h1, h2, these hyperplanes? I've cheated a little bit in drawing this. It's very, very systematic. It's, you know, it looks pretty in two-dimensional space. In n-dimensional space, with not everything going through the center, it's a lot more complicated. But the idea of what we're doing is right here. It's, it is that simple. Um, and really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to just say, uh, each we we put people in buckets. We, I've already said that uh, differently before. We we take each person and we allocate them to buckets. And if and if we if we accomplish that, we're done. We're done. So this is how we work. We go through something called a min hash, which is we gather the IDs of you know, for a person. We calculate the hash value for each of those like IDs. We store the min minimum value of that. We iterate a few times, you know, maybe a couple hundred times. And it gives us a hash that is actually quite representative of the, all of their, their likes. And this is something I'm not going to try to prove here or, uh, you know, or even in, in private. But it is, <laughs> you know, just, just take, it, take it as, as a proven result. Uh, it was actually proven about 15 years ago um, by a bunch of people at Stanford. Yes, sir. 
Yes, yes. So the, the hash, hash that you saw there, and now we're just talking about them as, as hash, hash functions. Um, so basically, we said we're going to do it with 200 hash functions. Well, why did we pick 200? Well, it was random. We, we, just, we just picked some. Um, and we're trying to really see if, um, if things hash to the same buckets or not. And what we're going to find is that we find that for hash functions one through five, maybe they all match. For hash functions six through 12, maybe they don't match. And, and so really what we're saying is we're going to consider it a candidate match if a whole bunch of them hash to the same bucket. But if they don't, in other cases, maybe that's OK. Um, and what we find is that as long as you pick a number that is not too small and not too large, it matches up pretty well. And we have to actually tune how many bands we pick off the hash functions. And if we, and we'll talk about how if we have too many hash functions in any band, then we get too many, a lot of false positives, which are bad, because that means that we we bunched people into the same bucket that they didn't really belong. And, or if we get too many false negatives, that's bad as well. But somewhere in between, there is actually a, 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 a medium space that, that, that works. Um, so if we had, for example, fewer than 20 bands, then we would have fewer pairs selected for comparisons. The number of false positives would go down. Number of false negatives would go up. Performance of our system would be much better. But the results wouldn't be as good. And, and so what we end up with is an algorithm that we can actually tweak and, and tune to get the kinds of results we're looking for. And there's, a, so there's quite a bit of tuning that we end up doing after we've written the, 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 the thing from one end to the other. So just a couple other things. Um, because we're talking about a large set of data uh, using uh, MapReduce like Paradigm is quite useful because then we can throw different images or different data at, at different processors. And if you think about it, you find that you can do, you can write a little map function. It's not that little, actually. It's a, it's a few hundred lines of code. It's not that much either. Um, and it emits a, a set of buckets. And the reducer then can take the, those buckets and, and set out the, the document numbers. And it, it works quite well. Um, and, and that is the algorithm. You know, it, it goes from one end to the other. It works in order n. And as long as we can optimize for how many hashes and what our bands look like, it gives us pretty good results. Um, so that was kind of where we left off in January. And someone raised their hand at that meeting and said, yeah, but what do I download? You know, I, I want to see this thing working on my machine, and that's and so that's really what we're here to talk about today is uh, what can you download and what can you run on, on your 
laptop or, or something that you have access to. Um, so what we've done is there's an open source project that, that we've got on GitHub that you're welcome to try to use. Uh, it organizes the various stages of the LSH pipeline as different pipelines. They can, exec they can all execute in parallel. So in other words, the first stage doesn't have to finish for the second stage to start working. And it produces results at the, at the end. There are a lot of options for, you know, how do you do the, uh, the, the n-grams, how, how do you really stem it properly, how do you break it up into words. Uh, so a lot of them are, uh, are, are options for you to, to configure some of them, if you don't like any of the options that we've created, you know, we're happy to have you work on your option and contribute that back to the, to the main branch. Um, and we're gonna, and the, the, dem, the demonstration we're gonna give or example that we're gonna be talking about is we read a Twitter stream and find similar tweets coming from multiple people all at the same time. I'm gonna hand that over to Teresa who did most actually of the, of the work in, in making it happen. Okay, is it the, this yeah. book? Yep. Okay. All right, so um, let's see. So uh, as you can see, it's in Python, which is uh, I'm very happy about. Um, it is, the project is very Google App Engine uh, centric, um, though you can actually run the pipeline and all of the LSH code that we have locally. Um, so the reason why we chose Google App Engine is because um, there's no setup. I mean, obviously, you know, you need a, an account. Um, I use PyCharm, which makes it very easy to set up a, um, and use a Google App Engine project and deploy it. Um, so it also has a very easy integration with MapReduce, so anybody who's set up Hadoop clusters either locally or in a production sense knows that it can be a real pain in the butt, so um, this gets you working really fast. Um, so we can also scale very easily, though, you know, currently we're just using one machine and, you know, in-memory shared resources, but this will allow us to test our algorithm at scale when, uh, when we're ready. And uh, it's very easy to get uh, to use uh, Django, which I have also had the displeasure of setting Django up by hand, and it can be a pain in the butt as well. So this made uh, everything uh, very easy. Okay, oops. Okay, so um, as uh, Jay mentioned, we hooked up um, our current LSH implementation, which uses the kind of simplest case of uh, using jar cards uh, similarity to kind of, you know, determine if documents are similar. Um, in the, so our, the implementation implements, uh, we have uh, the pipeline obviously, shingling, which is a kind of way of get, preparing the um, documents to be uh, processed, and, uh, and minhash, and obviously LSH. So, there are two options when you create the shingles. One where you can shingle by character, which is what I use by default, and you can also do it by words. I found that um, for the shorter documents like tweets, uh, the character shingling works quite well. Um, so as you can see, so the, uh, the threshold that we used, I think, was 74%, um, which is calculated. Um, we could talk about that later. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, so someone had retweeted that top tweet, um, and obviously it's a, it was actually really good at finding retweets. Um, but it also was good at finding, you know, a tweet that was very similar, except the mini, you know, the tiny URL was different. Um, so the results actually worked out quite well. I was very happy that it actually worked. <laughs> um, so there's a few things that, I mean, like right now we have a kind of basic uh, implementation, but there are a lot of ways that we can extend it. 
Um, there are many different um, distance measures that you can use. Like I mentioned, we're using Jacquard similarity, but depending on the dimensionality of your data, um, you, know, you can choose many other um, uh, distance measures such as Euclidean distance, cosine distance, edit distance, and Hammond distance. So um, we have made it so that you can implement your own uh, subclass of LSH and basically to use any distance uh, measure that you want. Uh, another thing like Jay had mentioned was uh, using some sort of map reduce uh, algorithm or finding a way to parallelize um, the LSH uh, algorithm. Uh, I think that it, I ha we haven't uh, gotten to this point yet, but that's like our next step. Um, because it's fairly iterative, I definitely think that it can be done. There is a paper by some researchers um, from MIT and Intel that, where they have a parallelized variant of LSH. So I'm going to be uh, doing some reading and uh, seeing if we can kind of apply that to what we have now. Um, and so as Jay mentioned, uh, you know, and as I mentioned that um, MapReduce is uh, very easy to uh, perform in Google App Engine. So I'm sure we'll be trying to leverage that. Um, so uh, so if we're looking for some use cases uh, to test out what we're doing. Um, so you can definitely contact us. Um, one other note about what we would like to do in terms of extending it. like. Um, we want things to be very configurable. Right now, there's a lot of kind of hard-coded values and you know, uh, default para you know, parameters and things like that. So we definitely want to make it very configurable and so that you could even uh, specify your own hash functions and things like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, work that could be done in the uh, processing and post-processing part of the pipeline, uh, which we haven't implemented. But um, there's definitely a lot of room for extending it. So, um, so you can go to our GitHub repo and clone it or fork it and uh, get set up and run it on Google App Engine. Um, there are some unit tests and there's one kind of ghetto integration test um, that you can run locally. Um, you'll probably see some commented out code of me running things. Um, one thing that I would like to do is get, get a more comprehensive uh, integration test set up so when changes are made you can you know, be confident that you haven't broken the algorithm and that your results are still consistent uh, with changes. So, so um, there you go. That's it. So if there's any questions. We did pretty well on time, actually. <laughs> I, I, went, I, I didn't ramble nearly as much as I usually do. For this. Yeah. Oh, the picture. <laughs> Does anybody know who that is? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Say what? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, younger Whitey. He doesn't have a white beard anymore, <laughs> you know. We can go back there. So it's, it's, I don't know if you have a, an answer, but it's basically which side of that hyperplane am I on? And it doesn't matter which side I am. I can call one of them zero and the other one the one. Right, so, exactly. So we don't, uh, so this is, it's very stylized and all of the lines go through the origin. That's, 
that's not real life, right? And the hash functions we use is basically n times k modulo something. And it's the n and the, the modulo number that, that we change. Yep. So in, in reality, it ends up being the hyperplanes are, are everywhere and they could be, um, you know, and, and, and they could just be wherever they happen to fall. So we, uh, do you have an answer? Uh, I think I understand the question. Are you try, Are you asking um, how you determine what your threshold would be or like? Uh, so I think it, de it actually depends on the approach. So in, um, it depends on the distance measure that you're using. So the measure that we're using, like what we implemented was Jacquard similarity. So there is a, there is a formula for calculating a threshold, which is based on the number of bands and the number of rows per band. So, and if you tweak those numbers, um, you actually get a lower or higher threshold. So, like for example, the results that I that we showed, uh, I think the threshold was like 74 percent, and that was using like 20 bands, uh, I think 10 rows per band, and we had like 200 minhas signatures. Right. So, and these are just kind of stock values that, you know, some documentation or literature said these are good to start with. But I think it really depends on kind of what you, you know, maybe you don't care about a high error rate. You just want to, you know, catch a lot of, you know, uh, do a lot of document comparisons. Maybe you want a much, you know, uh, lower error rate, which obviously means that you won't get as many results, but the results will be better quality. So I, I, I haven't explored a lot of the um, other distance uh, measurements, like individually, but I do know that it definitely de depends on uh, the data that you want to work with. Like, so for tweets, or even maybe even web pages, I think if you were you know, just using the content and stripping out HTML tags, it would be fairly simple, so you could use so just to add one more point to what Teresa said, you know, if you have 20 bands, your, your random choice of hash functions might end up meaning that one of those bands is absolutely useless in helping you find good similarities. But that's why you have 20 of them, right? If one of them doesn't discriminate, why well, that's okay. So, so the, the thing that I'm most interested in are uh, Twitter feeds because there's lots of opportunity. We talked about actually comparing into individual tweets, but you can also take that to, uh, to extend to all of your tweets as opposed to all of her tweets. And, and then that ends up meaning, you know, are, are you tweeting about similar things or are you tweeting about something completely different, right? And, and obviously there's a, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, a lot of work that people are doing in being able to utilize uh, what people are tweeting to figure out what we can, um, interest them in because we know what they're we know what they're interested in and so I think as far as marketing segmentation and all of that stuff it feeds into that did I answer your question yeah so in that case you might sorry say again yeah I would think so or even if a 
let's say yeah. um, Jay had the, actually had an idea that we kind of kicked around about, you know, trying to determine if, if we could from such a short amount of text, like if somebody's first language was, was English, let's say. Um, so you could combine that with some NLP step or something, you know. So definitely could be used for a lot of cool stuff. We didn't. We didn't, and and that's actually a good good step for us to to. Uh, and if somebody else wants to, you know, help us out with that, that's okay too. <laughs> Oh, sure. Sure. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, it would really be nice to have a few other people like help out. It would be really cool. Yeah, but, you know, don't do it for us. Do it for you. Yeah, and unfortunately, that that URL is case sensitive. So, um. any more questions? Or? Uh, so, in that, in our. Uh, in the yeah, in this case, like for. It's just a way to, like the bands just represent like a certain number of rows. So like, yeah, it's just a bucket. And it, and for, you know, just for the, just for kind of the general purpose, like if you have, let's say, a list of like 200 min hash functions, you know, like um, your first band is like the first 10, then the second band's the second, the next 10, like that sort of thing. So it's not bucketing like based on any specific topic. It's just a way to kind of segment out, um, to segment out the hash functions. Because what happens, at least in uh, the jar card uh, similarity implementation, you take, you know, that in number like vectors of hash functions, you hash it again, and then you, that's how it, you know that it's like, all right, this is, this bucket and this is this bucket. So it's not based, the bands are, don't represent any categories or anything like that. It's just a way to kind of segment out the hash functions so you can kind of do some sort of sampling. So you can minimize, that's how you really minimize the search spaces, hashing those vectors to some bucket. And then if some other documents like, like you know, first, like in rows, hash to that same bucket, you're like, all right, these must be candidates to be similar, and then you do the check. So, so that's pretty much like, like Jay had mentioned, there's, that's where the sampling happens and the, the hashing is part of that magic. So. so by the way, the, 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 all of this stuff is very widely written about. Um, so if you, if you just look it up, it'll, it's, it's all over the place. Yes, including on my blog, which is a ah! shame, shameless plug. <laughs> but I will be writing about it because I'm, I'm still learning about LSH too, so it definitely helps to write about it as well to prove that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.